There's a storm of legendary changes coming to the Atlantic League. Find out more on this week's episode of the Indie Ball Report podcast. Back again. 258. 258. Yeah, I didn't really know where to go for it from there. So I'm I'm glad you jumped in because I was kind of clueless there. I was about to be like, shout out 258. Uh, that's not an area code. So that's tough. Uh, not a Isn't hot it? start from the squad. Uh, yeah, apparently no. 250 is apparently somewhere in Indiana. So shout out Indiana. Gary. Now that we're in the right area code of baseball, let's talk about nice. baseball. So let's talk about Lancaster. Yes. Okay. I was hoping we'd start there because I got some, some late breaking developments here. Oh boy. Okay. So yesterday, meaning Thursday, they announced their rebrand before Lexington did, but in all fairness, we knew exactly what Lexington was doing on the rebrand. So not that big of a deal. We'll get to them in a minute, but Lancaster announced their uh, rebrand to just being the stormers drop the bar, no bar, no longer a barn burning the barn burned down. You could say. And their logo is now a cow. Got a word mark above it. There's a couple other uh, logos associated with it. The L remains as well. Um, but generally speaking, uh, I just seemed like kind of an odd rebrand, I think it's safe to say. Colors remained. And in case anyone was wondering why a cow, uh, it is supposed to symbolize strength, hard work, and determination. I think it's just kind of a cool looking cow, though. So that's kind of nice. And, hmm. uh, it's a kind of a weird move. They said they're doing it to re-energize the fan base, but it seems like a solid like 60, 40, not loving it online. Now, of course, it's online, so that's worth what it's worth, mm-hmm. but still. So I've had a few thoughts here. Um, the first was like, why? Um, yeah, and that's, that's, that's I mean, that obvious. It's just I don't understand exactly why this was necessary. We've talked before about, you know, it's a brand not aging well or a brand not being like community based and wanting some more community based. And so that's one front. And then like, okay, so I thought through possible things. So I thought through maybe, you know, that's why a lot of them rebrand. But if you look at this, Barnstormers is like the barn connection is very tied into Lancaster. If you all have been to Lancaster, you know, if you've seen the movie Witness, then you know Lancaster actually. So um, there's your homework for the day. Um, Harrison Ford, man, hell of a guy. Anyway, um, the other side, so I was like, okay, it's not that. Um, could it be like, this is in the weeds a little bit, but SEO, like we talked about how, you know, even if there's no lawsuit involved, it makes sense that the New England knockouts changed from the Chowda heads because when you look them up, you get another team. I was like, well, maybe if you're looking at barnstormer baseball, it wasn't going to them. It was going to like, you know, the, the barnstorming teams that used to play back in like the early years of baseball. But no, I mean that it was was all good Google results for them. You know, I don't know why I like the logo, but um, yeah, I don't know why. And, And I made a little uncomfortable. My initial instinct was, I don't really love the name change as somebody, by the way, this is my local indie ball team. If we're to, you know, have to go by the sh- the closest team to me. But uh, a lot of the comments, I was like, all right, let's go to the comments section. Because while that's not um, always the best way to gauge public opinion, it is a good way to usually gauge negative public opinion. Yeah. And it, it was extremely positive. So when I mentioned that on Twitter, sort of talking this through with somebody else who had tweeted about it and, and our own reservations about it, he pointed out because he's closer in the organization, and I'm not going to necessarily name names. He only said it publicly, so maybe it's fine. Um, so I'll just let it ride. Um, that it mo- that he said most of the people who I've seen express support for it are employees or former employees of the organization, which I've noticed before, like some you know fairly organized efforts of employees and friends of the team on certain things, not necessarily the barnstormers, but other teams I've seen sort of use that trick, flooding positive commentary into the comments. So it's interesting. I don't know what to make of this. Like the more, and then once I said that, multiple people came out of the woodwork and were like, yo, we hate this. Yo, we're trying to organize. Yo, we like, it was very, yeah, I saw like, yeah, like I saw almost like a protest planned or something I seen. Yeah. Something like that, which I don't know. But yeah, that seems extreme. But 
I, I, I here's the thing too, like I'm looking at like all the designs here, and like I do like the one here that's almost like the badge looking one that says Lancaster Stormers, and it has the bar in there with like the lightning around mm-hmm. it. I like yeah. that you have the two X's incorporated in it for two decades. So I like that too. Uh, you can kind of look around elsewhere for symbolism in some of them. I do think like aesthetically speaking, I think it was well done. I think the, the logos look good. It's just, I don't mm-hmm. know if this organization needed it, right? Like I'm agreeing in the sense of if it's for like an SEO purpose, mm. I get it. I get it, but But it doesn't seem to be, and it's gotten less localized and more generic. It's very odd. Yeah, like that's the thing I don't get here is like pointed out that the local they point out too that the fans were the ones who first picked this name twenty years ago. So I don't know, and it's not like they changed the colors up. Yeah, but like we said, what was it last week or the week before? Just because you have a fan vote doesn't mean like you have a fan vote. Agreed, but it does seem like this can be the popular name of the time. I love to see what the other options were, but that's neither here nor there necessarily. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, I'm looking it up though. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, what's kind of odd to me too is that they keep the L, like they kept the L logo there. And I didn't know there's really... such loyalty to that logo, by the way. The yeah, L, like, like I didn't know Lexington that either. Was... And it just. So yeah. here's a weird one. When I was in Lexington, they were talking about it. They they had just done a logo change, and it used yeah. to be the L on the hat, and they kind of switched away from that a little bit to like the Lex, yeah. and people didn't love the switch. I was like, why do you want the L? Like it's kind of an odd vibe. Yeah, but like, I, people why do you like want it, a giant apparently. L in your hat? Like I always think, like you know, as a kid, when you put the L on the head for loser. <laughs> yeah, I mean, shout out to the Smash Mouth. Like, I don't know. It's. Yeah, like that's yeah. the thing is like I just don't like there was no real demand for this. I don't think at least it doesn't seem like it was that popular for decision. I like heard nothing asking yeah. for that. And and yeah. I guess what I think maybe this is what you were going for, and, and maybe we're on the same page here. Yeah. The Lancaster Stormers brand and logo, all I think all together is in a vacuum good. Yeah. But when you're looking at it from what it was, like it just a lot of why and i think yeah. i've heard arguments that counterclocks was like that too since we're comparing the two a bit here but yeah. I, I don't necessarily know that uh i don't i don't think that was that great of a brand but i've seen its defenders um yeah man i don't really know totally what to say and, yeah, and it, i'm not totally prepared because i just like within the last 30 minutes stumbled into this conversation of a lot of people all of a sudden in my mentions like uh no <laughs> like ooh. okay like here's the thing it's just like where i land on it's just kind of like okay but why though like it looks good i think it looks overall nice i'm gonna be interested what the jersey design looks like Mm -hmm. and overall from a just purely aesthetic perspective i like it but like it wasn't really popular in market to make that decision Mm -hmm. you didn't really need anything like i would agree that you probably could have done a brand refresh kept barn in the name and then went to something similar to that and it would have been fine but like i just don't i don't understand why there's such a like this was a decision made i feel almost like it would be better to do as like an alternate logo on every like say friday night or something and it stands out to me i really see my thing is too it wasn't like like you and I have joked about the Ogden Raptors. The Ogden Raptors could do a brand change and you can be like, why? But also yeah. like, okay. But yeah. like the Barnes Rumors is a solid brand because if you think yeah. about it, like, all right, Meyer League and Independent Ball, it's a lot of small towns. But even very few small towns have the like one-to-one connection with farms and barns that Lancaster, Pennsylvania has. It's like yeah. known for it. It is known for it. It is kind of what you think of when you think of Pennsylvania. Like, and that's not an insult. Like that is, no. I, I, I love Lancaster. I, you know, they're the, the it's city of Lancaster, quaint. by the way, is actually a city too. That's the funny thing. Like it's got a vibe to it. It's got some cool concert venues, neither here nor there. Uh, did see some wild, just basement style grunge rock shows. That's a different combo. Um, but, uh, the, who says we don't have culture anyway? Uh, the, yeah, that's culture. It just, yeah. And to ditch it is so confusing. It really is. And I know it's how. So like, sure. And that is sort of, you know, funny and penciled in from like, 
the it's technically a bowl, whatever. But it, 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 you don't really need that for the stormers. You could have gone with a storm or whatever. Even yeah, I'm like sure I like feel like might have some thoughts. Was done because like, hey, people still like the mascot, so we just work. People the love mascot. Silo, bro. Yeah, yeah. like Silo is popular, so what the hell? We might as well just go ahead and incorporate the bull cow into the uh, new logo. Also, it was pointed out to me by somebody that apparently, and I missed this, so I'll have to go back and look, but apparently they unveiled like the schedule or whatever too. Maybe it was online, yeah. I guess. And it like beat the legends to the punch on the name announcement by several hours, but no one noticed. But, uh, and but, like we all already knew. So like, yeah. And knowing the way the front office operates is probably just an oversight. But part of me was like, wouldn't it be funny? Cause Langston has been teasing for like over a month that this thing was going to happen. And like yeah. two weeks ago, Lexington was like on this date and Lancaster's like, cool. <laughs> I realize you couldn't see me. It's an audio medium. That's my fault. But as long as Nick's happy, he got the effect. Yeah, I mean, like I seen it and it was kind of funny. So, you know, that was good. Yeah, you know. For, for all. Um, but yeah, just like, I guess like my last thoughts on this is just like, and I understand like colloquially it's stormers, right? You just, you don't, you drop yeah. the first part of it. But I also feel like, view it like the Diamondbacks are just called the D-backs, but you wouldn't just call them D-backs. Like it's the formal official name, right? Or Or the backs, really. Yeah, really. Uh, so, like, so, so weird. Yeah, it's just it's, that's the thing. Like, it's not like I have that much of an issue with it. It's just like a weird decision, and like I just would love to know their internal thought process on it. Um, I have a theory, and you know, and I might have to investigate this later. And I, I apologize, mm-hmm. that's not great pod- podcast content, but I want to avoid the me researching mid recording here. Okay. Um, but part of me is like, I wonder if they missed a renewal on something. Like a trademark, because doesn't this feel like one of those like why type of things? And they have a great yeah. reputation too. So why would they change? I mean, they just won two championships. They have a great ballpark. They've seem to have a really good relationship with their fans. So it's not like Lexington when they chose the counterclocks because it was more of a we need to be different quick. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm like searching for reasons. I, I don't. I, my brain doesn't want to believe they just were like this is something that we should do and must do and not as an alternate just as like, like sunday stormers would have been a vibe yeah could have done that i don't see anything about a trademark yeah. expiring but in fairness i've only looked at this for about 90 seconds so i mean we'll see but like that's what i, I guess if nothing else it, it's just that's exactly where i'm at on yeah um yeah, it's just like on, I said, I just this like, entire rebrand is just so confusing. Yeah, it's just like it's just not necessary. I, so, I like the um, sort of barn logo still being in the one Lancaster Storm, like mm-hmm. the circular. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen. Uh, yeah, no, I've seen that one. The one to double okay. X, yeah. Yeah, I like that one. Uh, but it's just still very odd, man. Yeah, it definitely is. But maybe uh, we'll have someone. Uh, now, I will say some of the people who are very vocal about wanting to be on the pod. I'm not going to sign you up for that one. Um, maybe if I'm getting, and maybe if they start to gain a little traction, maybe we'll, I'll entertain it on my page if you don't want it. Yeah. But may, I mean, maybe we need to have somebody on and then be like, what? <laughs> like, uh, I mean, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry, it's just, it's still in summary, man. I'm just, I'm confused. It's not about the new brand being bad. It's just about I don't understand moving on from the previous one. Yeah, it just like I guess I just would like to see the internal thought process because in that one, yeah. it's hard to see. But in this next one, it's pretty straightforward, which would be the Lexington unveil. This yes. was Thursday night unveil. Um, it was largely expected to be the Legends. It wound up being the Legends again. They also mm-hmm. announced Greg Zahn as the club's manager for 2024. Studio yes. Simon did the mm-hmm. Mighty Lex logo, and Mighty mm-hmm. Lex is a personified baseball man type character. Mm-hmm. Check the social medias, uh, the salt tweeted out there, or check the show notes for all that too. So, yeah. What do you think? I think it's the right decision to go back to Legends. It was what was popular mm-hmm. in the area, reviving a lot of the old logos too. Probably a good decision because, again, like I get it, you want to sell merch and whatnot, but. I'd be willing to sacrifice some merch sales for rebuilding loyalty in the area and rebuilding mm-hmm. trust in the community. Also, there's enough new stuff here where you can sell the new stuff too. I think again, just it was popular 
in the area. So you go with what's popular in the area and you start to rebuild everything that was essentially destroyed over the last two, three years and start to climb back up the mountain and hopefully it works itself out. As far as what I think about Zahn, that's a different situation. Mm-hmm. That's, that's an situation. interesting situation for sure. Um, exactly. I mean, they do need a man list, so, you know. Oh, dude. Okay, where do we begin with that? Because first, I will say, I, I think the I yeah. seen from what I've seen, I like the entire brand. Uh, I think the logo is good. They have the right elements. They kept the right elements from the Legends brand. Um, mm-hmm. I've had I've expressed issues in the past. Here's a weird nitpick thing from working with it. They brought the L logo back. Interesting, but the um, the logo. The if you ever had seen it, it was like a horseshoe. It was like a guy with a bat. It was a lot going on, and it was also a little tilted. So nothing you ever made graphics wise would ever look centered. It was uh, it would drive you nuts. So that good call. And the the guy with the bat, the baseball man, old school thing. I get it. Lean mighty Lexer. He has yes, name. obvious. Um, not Big L, which I always thought was a questionable name for a mascot, but I like that he has a mascot. Bring the or the uh, mustache. Bring the mustache back. It's a great move. That was one of the best pieces of branding. I mean, literally, you could, if your brand awareness gets solid enough, you can just put mustaches places and it works as branding. Like it's fantastic. Or, or mustache with QR codes. Like I love it. So uh, that side, we both agree on the branding that the branding's you know yes. turn up very now, solid. Now let's now. get the, the the probably more interesting take here, which also I will say too, I find it hilarious that Lexington has to have a brand new uh, Twitter handle as well. Oh, I should say I just here's something a podcast yeah. exclusive. Um, as it became evident that there would be a Lexington legend once again, yeah, uh, I decided to send back via Instagram uh, their TikTok. Login because oh, yeah? since being fired and because they didn't have their ducks in a row, they did not acquire that from me. And <laughs> um, I kept it. So there's Petty Ryan. And they said, Hey, do you have that? And I said, Nope, no idea, bud. No clue. But doesn't this go back to your phone number when we uh, asked for the pathway? And weird, didn't get it. Yeah. I got it every time. I got it every time. I ain't helping you out. But yeah, now they're legends again. All right. And new ownership. That's fine. Okay. So yeah, there you go. You got it back. There's there's the behind the scenes on Petty Ryan. But I just hope Andy Shake calls you and goes, "Oh, but you couldn't get the Facebook login." I know, right? How I, I wonder. I should check their Facebook and see how their ticket sales are going over there. You should. But, oh, uh, Charleston. Anyway, where were we? Yeah. Well, we were talking about Greg Zahn and hiring a manless to man mm. the ship here. Goodness. It's. Do you want this, or I can start? I, I mean, like, it? here's the thing: from a strictly baseball perspective, I think it's probably a good hire, mm-hmm. right? Agreed. Guys, been what a decade and a half in the majors, mm-hmm. so it's hard to really say that's a bad decision to hire. Do with that much major league experience has done a bunch of other uh, things in baseball too. It's just the problem is if you look at Greg Zahn, uh, well, would it be he works Sportsnet if I'm not mistaken because it's Blue Jay mm-hmm. analyst. So yep. you go. Greg Zahn, Sportsnet departure, you're going to get a very interesting set of results. And I just don't know if that is what you want to bring into a new organization. Yeah. Um, okay. So I assume he's, um, I assume they're bringing him in because yeah, Lexington was not a very good setup for players, even though it, it should be by all accounts, but it was just very disorganized. And my read was they went the cheap way a lot when Andy was in town and that made it difficult. And then the new ownership didn't really do anything with it last year for players. And then this year they're going to have to kind of rebuild its ownership, who's kind of new to the indie ball scene. So there's going to be some growing pains. Uh, from what I hear, I talked to some guys who worked with Greg in the Pioneer League and he is um, he's f- for the boys for sure. Yeah. Uh, the, he's, I, he's got good reviews from clubhouse guys, from, uh, players and from some other staff members that have been around him. Uh, so that I assume is kind of to smooth that transition. Yeah. Uh, it's a good opportunity for him. So it makes sense to take it, even though it might be a bit of a gamble going to Lexington because it's new ownership and all that. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you have, when you have a New York time or a New York post article that, mentions that 
uh, female staffers detail the misery of working with MLB is quote man on list. It's a bad vibe. Uh, yeah. Essentially, he was fired for inappropriate behavior and comments with multiple women throughout the the office of the news station. It, it's um, it, it, like the whole brand they kind of brought to the table was like apparently this very like aggressively masculine vibe, and would like wear undershirts around the office and make like rude sexual comments about and like directly to the women, uh, or like where they could hear them. It, it was these were basically backed up by just by anybody he didn't even try to deny it it sounds like he was just like oh my bad okay yeah no it, um, he did issue an apology a few months later i believe it was after he was yeah. fired so there is that but yeah and then he did his own youtube thing like called manalist tv which that feels like you're not great. really sorry about it what doesn't you did. feel well yeah so okay you know I'll That's be honest here. My initial read of that was Manalist is in like, oh, these women don't get it. Yeah. I, it, it did seem to be his pre existing nickname was okay. Manalist, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But to then steer back into it, it's tough because it is his brand at that point. But to yeah. steer back into it with the connotation that's like for men only after getting in trouble for that, it doesn't read well at the very least. And at the worst, it's like, what have we learned? Uh, yes, it's a concern. Now, again, I've heard nothing. I, I didn't hear anything negative come out of his work in the Pioneer League. To be fair, to be I did not speak to any of the women who worked with him because I don't, I'm not connected with them. I don't know them like that. I'm not going to slide into some woman's DM who's just trying to make it as a, a female working in the sports world and be like, hey, was this guy weird to you? <laughs> it just doesn't feel like a great interaction, though maybe it would be. Maybe I should be asking that question. That's on me for not fully knowing. Th that's my, in summary, um, it's a choice. It, more than anything, it's a choice for a team that needs good PR to bring in a guy who has had several years of bad PR. Yeah. And like, I should point out that the whole instant thing happened at the end of 2017. So it's been a while Thank since you, yes. that happened, but it was also enough to get you fired. So like, yes. that's the thing. And the fact he really hasn't been picked up by any other major like news corporation tells me either he's not worth the headache, at least from an analyst perspective, or that there is an ongoing issue. One or the other. Now I think it's probably more the prior than the latter. Just why bring that headache in when you could go ahead and just get a more recently retired player that's probably more appealing to the precise fan base or has more of a brand recognition. But even still, like, I don't really know where I land on it. Like, it's not a good look. I agree 100% on the PR perspective of it. Not great look. That being said, how many choices do they have for this opening? Right. Like if you don't have too many guys that really want to throw their hand up and say, Oh, I'll take it, then you know, if he's the best candidate you have, you hire the best candidate you have, right? Right. I, I would say and I wouldn't be surprised if there's some sort of connection between him and ownership, because this late in the year it tends to be an I know a guy type of thing. Yeah, and I feel like we may have mentioned this at one other point, right? Like when the mm -hmm. sale went down, and everything. I feel like we did research into him because we were like, Ooh, this could be yes. this could be something. So I'll be interested to see how that shakes out and how long he stays in the position too. I mean, like if it's a one-off thing and that's it, and then there's no other problems and it is what it is. But if it's remains to be an ongoing theme, then it's a problem and it got to, you know, got to be handled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. I don't have much else to add. It, it yeah. is just going to be a lot of wait and see. And, you know, maybe it's changed. Yeah, it's just but, very delicate. That's the problem. It's extremely delicate in the way it goes. They I'm not going to sit it. here and say somebody shouldn't work again based on stupid behavior several years ago because back in 2017, 2016, I believe, I found myself in jail for two weeks for partying too hard. So I think I New probably, Orleans, and I'm open about it. I don't care. Like, so whatever. But like, I'll be the first one to say, like, yo, like, I'm people change. Like, I, I then worked for multiple years with children at a church, like, helping teens get their lives together. So, like, whatever. Um, I, so I will not say like that he's not a different person and that be, he should never be allowed to work again. I, but what I'm saying is, you know, it, it's something to be aware of and, and it, one, something to be aware of and something to like, hopefully we see that he has made some changes and also, uh, <laughs> that it is a bold choice 
for from a PR standpoint for a team that needs good PR. I think that's fair to say. We're not overly judging. Just to say at face value, that's what we're looking at. Exactly. It's just it's not always a decision to hire a dude that has a section on Wikipedia that's titled firing. Well, and don't forget the Mitchell report too. Oh yeah, that too, and the whole steroid thing. But I mean, that seems to be a, a lower priority thing. Yeah, I know. Mitchell Report is what it is. I mean, I, I have mixed feelings on it myself. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to necessarily fault an um, aging catcher in a league full of guys taking steroids for being connected to steroids. It, it, full disclosure, I kind of think it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also a lot of people are using roids. So, like, sure, you surprise a dude trying to hang on. It's going to be like, you know, everybody else is using them. I might as well try to, you know, do what I can to extend my career. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, right. So I think that just about covers the both rebrands and whatnot. Moving from rebrands to, in a sense, relocations, but not in the traditional meaning. Which is to say, the Oakland Ballers were going to be playing at Laney College. They're not going to be playing at Laney College anymore. They're going to be moving to Raymundi Field in West Oakland. The team's going to spend approximately $1.6 million in the ballpark to enhance it with upgrades including scoreboard upgrades, uh, track man, portable bleachers that will hold up to two and a half thousand fans, as well as uh, some improvements done to the drainage and irrigation systems, as well as work done to the warning tracks. Temporary lockers or locker rooms will be added uh, to the facility as well. This is currently a one year agreement, but there is an extension in the works. So Thoughts on moving from Laney College to Raymond D. Field? I mean, I feel like we kind of read the room pretty early on that Laney yeah. didn't seem feasible. Um, I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's a Pecos League field. Let's call it what it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's surrounded by a lot of abandoned cars slash mm-hmm. junkyard. Um, and the satellite image of it is a rough situation. So I don't know. They got a lot of work to do before, you know, first pitch, but yeah. I guess they still have several months. So they got time and apparently money. So I, I mean, I'm going to trust it on that one. Uh, as long as they can figure out parking, it is, I don't really know the area like that, but it, yeah, it's, uh, I it's in there. I believe that they were going to try to get a BART. <laughs> yeah. I think they were going to try to get a BART stop in there too. So mass transit would mm-hmm. be fairly local and nearby there but yeah i mean this is i mean look at some of the overhead pictures admittedly uh this field is in rough condition and it feels honestly it feels less pecos leaky and more like pacific association like i mean yeah and it's like 360 to dead center which is fascinating yeah that's this is not to bring up the baseball logistics side of this i know that's not really been the the general tone when it comes to how they're going to make this work but i'm just going to point it out um yeah i mean like i'm just like looking at this field right now and man like i see like some mock-ups here right like i see like this mm -hmm. graphic design as to what it's supposed to look like and i'm still just not seeing it like it feels a little optimistic Yeah. It feels like there's just too much work to be done in like the time frame you need to get it done in. A B. It also feels like running a professional baseball organization Ooh. out of this field is just like such a tough scene on it. Yeah, just generally speaking, this is a rough situation here, mm-hmm. and I think they're making what was already not exactly the easiest situation to work. Something that. Well, yeah, you had a lot of local support, a lot of fan support working towards. You made it just that much more difficult. And, ah, uh, God, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this. Okay, so so many things just went through my head in about a few seconds here. Because yeah. um, first thought was, it really is giving me Hinchla vibes. The way they're really pushing the historic factors. Um, I thought that too. I went over to the Brody Brazil video about this. Okay. Um, I still don't know what to make of him, but it's mm. got some feedback on it. Just to see the comments, because there's going to be a lot of locals, still a lot of positivity around it. Um, I, I do think, though, his video is a little optimistic. Uh, 
However, I think also there's some motivation from the city. I mean, they're getting a park basically fixed up for, you know, uh, on the cheap and it's getting really, really well cleaned up. So that's maybe part of this here. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm also going to note that like just in the comments is just like apparently the Ogden owner just like yeah. dropping in to say thanks. Hilarious vibe. So confused by Ogden still. Um, yeah, but I don't I don't want to be negative. So I don't know. <laughs> it's just I mean, it, it's definitely not an ideal setup. And yeah, you um, know, I don't know. It's a very optimistic view of things. Is that a coincidence? A drop like right as they're about to sell some tickets. I mean, you, they had to have the stadium announcement done yeah. for them to sell tickets because what are you buying tickets to? I would not be surprised to see this change a little bit. Plus, I have the question: Is this now? Are, like, where are their offices? Is this going to be a situation of their offices are are way away from everything else? Yeah. Plus, like, I, mean, there I are, don't know what's the what's the area like as well. You know, like there this... are office buildings and like maybe condos across the street that look nice and new. Okay. So honestly, the area. So essentially, it, the vibe I'm getting is uh, back to where I was. Let's see. Looks like first. Let's call it left. Nope, I'm backwards. It's right field. So like right field seems to be new condos. You've got left field is a, like a glass plant, it looks like. Glass and then plant. down the third baseline, it's like junkyard possible. Oh, it's a tent city, boys. Now, this is in the most recent photography. Oh, it's from 2024. Okay, so a bit of a tent city. Um, ooh, yeah, there's a joke in there. They I had... do it. Shout yeah. out San Francisco. Anyway. Um, yeah. The thing you get I just to see San Francisco shared. represented with the new Oakland team. There's the joke I wanted. Um, and then it would apparently is, it seems to be a junkyard on the other side. There's more park down the first baseline. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. The area is a little bit concerning to me. I hate to say it. Mm-hmm. I really do. But it kind of is giving me like running for class president kind of vibes where like we're doing all these different things and we're going to do so much stuff around here. And then you didn't really, you know, cross every T. And now you got to go like, okay, so Laney College isn't going to work, but this will work. I mean, yeah, like a lot was promised at Laney College, too. So yeah, we're, we're bailing on that. Yeah. That, like I'm looking- yeah it's, it's negative. I get it. I'm just, <laughs> I'm like, it's tough uh, to say. You know who is in my head. Yeah. What's the what's the, the you know the guy the owner? I don't yeah. know. Oh, he was on effectively wild man. I love effectively wild. Yeah. I didn't love the vibe. Yeah. Still, of course, I'm biased at this point because I've kind of made up my mind in, in some ways about it. Yeah. Um, but it just doesn't surprise it me to see you know, yeah. some promises on something. And then the moment, big promises. And then the moment you realize the details are completely unfeasible, you go, Oh, and this now, this now, actually go look at this thing. This is what we're doing now. And look how great it is. It's historic. It's great. And like, okay, what if this turns into a garbage fire? And did they say they're doing all their home games there? I feel like they said only part of the season or was I off on that? I feel like it's probably most of the season, if not all, no. I guess I don't know why I I had it, that it might be split, but I mean I could be wrong, but it's still. Well, I just I don't think they made would... forty eight home games at the park. You're right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's it's just a red flag. Uh, mm-hmm. That's it. It's all it is. It's not saying it's going to suck. It's not saying it's going to be an issue. It's not saying it's going to be Hinchliff, but it's a red flag, and that's from the point of view of what we already have seen around indie ball and with other organizations, like it's, uh, I don't know. I'd love to hear more about Laney college. Yeah. Like, it just for the, from the perspective of what does it look like when you say you're going to do something, you realize it doesn't work. Did it leave on good terms? Is everybody happy? Is this like, we agreed it was for the best or is this like, you know, yeah. tough. We're out. 
because this yeah. has to work for us. And which, I mean, is a thing, but just be transparent about it. Like, because I'm sorry, looks like the Oakland ballers have already bailed on as many stadiums as the Oakland A's have in Oakland. Mm. Like it's kind of a bad vibe. Yeah. Saying, like I want to you know, know what the whole, thing is not bailing. Yeah. I need to yeah. know what the backstory is on it. And like, funny. I get it. Like, again, like I'm also like, what's the, what's the crime map looking like for this area too? I mean, keep in mind, Laney didn't necessarily have the best vibe, like on the crime. Yeah, beat. like that's. I think that's something that's important. <laughs> I'll to say too. the thing too. I mean, sure. Yeah, but I mean that's important too. It's like there, it's not like Laney was perfect, but we all were like, oh, well, Laney's going to be the temporary home for like a couple of three years, and then they'll get like an actual stadium, right? Yeah, and now, now it's like this well, also isn't a stadium either. So yeah, and the thing is, like, if you're going to put 1.6 million into it. You're not staying there for like three years and leaving. And and I'll point out the thing too, which is I'm I'm indecisive about whether or not what's going on with the Oakland A's right now is a good thing or a bad thing for them. Because I think like, it's a bad thing to be honest with you. Right. All right. So I don't think they're gonna stay in Oakland. I think it, it's gone too far. However, um oh Raymondi. Interesting. Yeah. Um yeah, I'll send it to you. Um, so uh, it, it, I don't think they're going to stay in Oakland, but they might be in there for a few years. And like, that is on one side, a nightmare because you have the, you know, the team is still there. The MLB competition is right there. On the other hand, it's good because you can continue to, you know, like we've said before, they can continue to needle at it and poke at it. And it's us and it's them and look at them, look at us. You know, while they're in town, because I always said it was going to be weird once they left, but they're still trying to draw the comparisons. Um, I just, I don't know. Um, yeah. it, it's, I think I found it. It's like orange on the crime map. I got to remember what that means, though. Um, yeah, and like I don't want to sound super negative. Like I like, I, I've said before, I like this like project, for lack of a better term. I yeah. just, it's very worry. interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's I. I don't want it to be a mess because this is so public now. Like I hope they understand this is so public, and this isn't just a gl- a glamour project. And I know they said it's not, but okay, it's not like this cannot just be. It's real now. It, you have people in five invested. years. I don't want to be like. I don't want to hear that he was the guy. Oh, he's the guy who did that. A team in Oakland. Remember that thing? Like that news story. But, and now it's in the past already. It was just some thing, some right, like just some. Yeah. You, you don't, know, you want to avoid the very thing we were saying. Yeah. The beginning, where it's like, yeah. oh, we're just going to throw this here and see if we can't capitalize on the spite of this, of the A's leaving. Mm-hmm. And two or three years later, once everyone's kind of gotten over it, then we're just screwed. I continue to say, I think the intentions of the people within the organization are good. I don't trust the people at the top of it. And frankly, I don't trust the city of Oakland. Um, mm. I think any, a, and I think along with this, there's all the positive things being said by the city of Oakland. But of course, because it's cheaper to have the Oakland Ballers and the Oakland A's, call it what it is. They're equally responsible for the team leaving. Um, so yeah, they yeah. in in they're getting the Oakland politicians are getting some sort of credit for having a professional team there that cost a fraction of what an MLB team would cost to have. So, you know. Yeah. And and in the meantime, you just already have seemingly no plan. And it's so nerve wracking to watch this because I feel like it's going to be messy. I just see, don't see any other way. And the thing that I wonder here is, right, mm-hmm. let's say either the A's stick around for an extra couple of years or even better yet, if the situation in Vegas falls apart, no other city really wants to step to the plate and, you know, take them and they're stuck in Oakland, and they wind up staying there, let's say Fisher winds up selling. Mm -hmm. Then what's the plan? What's the plan? You have a Pioneer League team that That is is sitting in a major risk. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. And you're seeing now all sorts of different insiders and reporters that all focus on Major League Baseball all saying the same thing, where it's like, A's don't really have a plan right now, and if Vegas falls apart, no one's surprised. Mm Mm-hmm. It's very Arizona Coyote-esque. 
where it's just like up oh, they leap before they uh actually saw what was underneath them they were just like yeah somewhere down there there's a ledge and i'll land on the ledge and they didn't realize oh wait that ledge is pretty small and it's pretty far down there and i gotta make sure this is timed exactly right otherwise i'm gonna fall into a chasm yeah man what yeah, screen sharing it's easier just do that yeah let's see uh, hold up. I think we're good. Okay. Just pick the worst possible way to format something, which is classic. Um, yeah, send I'm just going to DM that shit probably on Twitter. All right. Yeah. That's for easy. Unnecessary no, all right, I got Twitter up, so you're good. Cool. Um, yeah. And I know I'm so cautious about being the negative guy, but it's just like, I'm sorry, if you're making news, you're probably doing something weird. <laughs> and if you're yeah. doing something weird, it's a high probability. I'm like, what are we doing here? Um, yeah. And just, it feels like when you have to hype this up that much, you know it's not a good look. They're selling and like, it. Yeah, and what I keep coming back to, I guess my main concern outside the facility itself and making sure that everything is done on time in the next roughly three months, three and a half months, is just that you made a big deal, called the big press conference, did all that comes along with that, right? Mm-hmm. And now you got to turn around and, well, you got to go ahead and eat that one. And and where I get very protective is, I lo- I've said, I love Indie Ball so much. I love it. And it's so rarely in the proper spotlight and it's gotten so much attention. And if if this dude and his little group come in to indie ball and then stand on stage and go, Hey, everyone, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And, and everyone looks at them to see the performance and they pull their pants down and take a shit. I'm going to be furious. And I'm going to go as far as I possibly can to make sure whatever sketchy fake college academic endeavor he has next is completely ruined by the fed. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like I would have, I would make a call every day. I will call every student who's ever gone to one of those schools until that guy is bankrupt. I don't care. I will be livid, dude. Yeah. I mean, as you should be. I mean, the thing is, like, a I lot f- of people see it as just, it's what it is. It's a side show. It's what it is. But there's so many people's lives, people's lives that are on the line you. with it. Yes. It's lives, it's careers, it's not just players alone who admittedly, you know, what you're getting in the Pioneer League, you get in the Pioneer League. We understand, and every player going into the Pioneer League understands the odds of you advancing higher up. Because already just to make a career in baseball, the odds are slim. Mm -hmm. It's something you know walking in. But you don't need to make that even more difficult with garbage ownership that goes in haphazardly, that doesn't treat it the way it needs to be treated which is not just some sort of fun like side activity it's not the way you'd run like an expansion team in the show it's an actual real baseball team that has dozens of employees and dozens of people that will uproot their lives to spend either the whole year or half the year there putting themselves on the line, putting their careers on the line to try and build an organization up and to try and, you know, get to that next professional level. So to just treat it haphazardly is a slap in the face to all of them. And not to mention, when you do something as public as this, when it fails, it makes everything look bad. And the already existing stereotype, as we were discussing a bit last week of oh that's just what indie ball is when you give them ammunition like this to just reinforce the current belief and stereotype you don't undo that damage there's just no way to do it because it's just way too reinforced yeah really and it's one of those ones two words like it takes so much to build up Mm indie ball and like legitimize and show people what it actually is and all it takes is like one dumb thing happening that reinforces what people think it is 
to knock it so much back down so much faster. So, yeah, and and to the point of like so many lives are wrapped up in this, and we're talking about employees, we're talking about careers, we're talking about futures. Frankly, that's why this was a red flag. This owner since the jump with his like sketchy college background. So like, you know, that's why I've got a couple of messages in the back that are like, dude, you're too hard on him, too critical about it. That's not really what it is. But I've read the paperwork. Like, it's kind of what it is. So we're not saying this is going to be a, a, a bad situation. But what I'm saying is I'm still watching this because I don't trust it at all. And until there is not only a six opening day success is not even going to be a, it. Like it better be prolonged and looking out for the community the way it says it's going to look out for the community and, you know, backing up what they say they're going to do and saying they're going to be at Laney College and they're going to make a bunch of improvements to Laney College's field and facilities and then being like, hmm, this is hard. Never mind. Is a bad vibe if that's how this went. Yeah, I, I see exactly where you're coming from on it. And it's just like opening day is just one milestone that you have to hit, but there's a bunch more along the way. And that's where my concern becomes. And it just there's just so much that's wrapped up in it, right? It's not even it's not even like limited just to this organization. Keep in mind, they still own the YOLO team, too, by the way. Yes, they do. So that's just something you got to watch. So if this goes south, it affects two franchises, and that largely affects the league as well. Yeah. So it, it's there's a lot into it. There's a lot into it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it, the critique really is more or less just... I don't even want to call it skepticism, but it's just like I think it's impressing upon the importance of the situation and how if it's bad, it is really genuinely bad. This isn't like, oh well, you know, it's not a good luck, and you know they'll have to do something quickly to fix it type of situation. It's genuinely like, no, if it goes bad, and this situation is what it can be on a you know level of disaster. It's more than just like, uh, well, that's a shame. It's like, oh, no, this is a problem type of situation. Yeah, I agree. Shades of the Texas Augie Garrido post-game rant. And the, it's not a game. Don't you get that? We're talking about our lives. <laughs> but that's, that's, I mean, not to compare myself, but I, that is exactly why I'm upset. <laughs> I'm just like, ugh. Uh. That's it. I'm glad you get it, though. You make me feel a little more yeah. sane. Well, yeah, because I think the thing is, when you're close to the situation and you know all the people in there and you know what mm-hmm. they have to give up and you know the situation behind it, then you know that it is more than just like, oh, it's a baseball team. It didn't work out. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, hell, dude, I've been on the other end of it. I know. I- better than damn near anyone. I mean, anyone that's ever even remotely considered, like, you know, I'd like to work in sport understands, like, wait a minute, it's not just, like, an office job where you show up, like, 9 to 5, and then you go home, and then, like, you do some cool, fun stuff with some spreadsheets and everything. No, it's, like, you genuinely spend the whole day, in the case of baseball, at the ballpark, you're doing a little bit of everything, and especially when you're in the baseball op side of things, and you have to go and give your word, like, hey man, you come here, you come to play here, we can make your we can extend your career, we can improve your career. And then if it doesn't wind up working out, having two months down the road, go to the same player, look him in the eye and tell him, Hey man, we gotta let you go. You're just not performing. And know that, hey, I very well could be ending a man's career. It's serious shit. The whole thing is serious. Not to mention the people starting out and really most of the people in the whole thing. It's not like you're doing this for the money. There's no money in it on this level. You're doing it because you love doing baseball. You love being involved in sport. That's why you're doing it. You're doing it for the emotional payoff. Otherwise, why the hell would you work long hours in largely whatever the hell the elements are that given day? It could be 105 or it could be 55 and driving rain 
do all that for like 38,000 a year. Yeah. That's, that's what I want to do. Like, come on. Everyone knows why this is. And so if you want to go ahead and cut the legs out on a bunch of people across that spectrum, guys that are just starting out and give them pretty much nothing to be able to have on their resume. Like, Hey, look, I was part of this team that fell apart and failed. Like you can go and call the failed ownership here, but there's probably going to put some blame on me for whatever reason, because they couldn't manage their shit. Or you cut the legs out on guys that have been in the industry for a while and probably gave up some sort of security to come and take a chance here. And you're just screwing them over. And then you have just regular folk that said, Hey, you know what? I want to try this thing and gave up what was probably on paper, a better position to be in to give it one shot at doing what they truly wanted to do. And it ain't right to do it people like that. So if you're not doing everything you can to make sure the organization succeeds, then it, it speaks more volumes about the actual people running the organization. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I mean, I got to try to paint this more positively than I currently am. And I just can't, <laughs> I, I feel so bad about it. Kind of, well, but, like, but it's like, you're telling me that when the entre the educational entrepreneur and the movie guy got together, that they weren't sure how to make a community college ballpark into a professional ballpark in five months. I, I would be shocked. Yeah. That's yeah. I'm trying to be positive. I don't know. I mean, even people from the league, anonymous people, so what does it mean? It means nothing, whatever. I'll say it anyway. But, um, like multiple anonymous people have been like, this is not good. Like people who mentioned it beforehand are like, this is a bad book. So they can spend it any way they want. If something didn't work. See, that's, and that's the question I want to answer. Yeah. What didn't work? Was it that they started saying things that they couldn't deliver? They got ahead of themselves. They didn't realize what Sony looked like. They didn't realize what the college was up for. They would they interest with the, the timing of this would have to look like I, something went wrong and I'd love to know what so that we can all like for accountability. Like if they want to be all about accountability, what went wrong with Laney? Tell us. And then let's see what you do better. How did you grow from this? Because like they can say this is the next big exciting announcement, but this is the first failure of an organization we have both been very much like wary of. And it, that's the reason I'm like, I want to spotlight it, not to be like, yeah. look at this failure. I'm saying like, let's look at this so they know that people are paying attention and they are accountable to someone other than their ego. Yeah. And I was trying to like spin it to like, the, okay, this could be a positive thing. If it winds up being a situation where it's just like Laney just wasn't able to accommodate mm -hmm. them, like the facility work out, I don't know, maybe let's say there's like a lack of stanchion lighting or, or something like that. So if that is the case here, then, all right, you could call it as, all right, well, this will fit a lot more into the uh, narrative that they have going on of, like, this is the team for Oakland, about Oakland. You put it right in the middle of Oakland. It really does make, uh, you know, make it go a little bit more in sync with that kind of, look, we're all about Oakland. We're all about the Bay kind of thing here. Um, it also could just be a case of, when you're on a college site, you're dealing with more bureaucracy throughout. That's certainly a possibility here. And if it's a matter of, look, we wanted to come in, we wanted to do all these things, but now you're not able to do it because whether you had to fight with the state or with the college or with the city or with all the above, if you could cut that down to just like, hey, we just deal with the city, that makes life easier. That could right. very well be it too. And who knows? Maybe it's like, all right, we're going to do all this work with Laney, but if they're not willing to commit to a long-term deal, why do we want to invest all that money in something where we're not going to be in for 10 years, right? When you could say, mm -hmm. well, let's start investing in Ray Mundy and we could presumably stay there for a while and you just go ahead and, you know, keep the ballpark. I don't want to say keep it presentable, but keep it to the point where it is acceptable to play professional baseball games in it. Until there comes a point where maybe we have enough traction and enough, I don't want to say enough clout because that makes it sound so like so trivial, but to have enough standing in the community that you could push to have an actual minor league stadium built that you could use. Maybe that's it. 
I'm also trying to give them the benefit of the doubt on the way it's going here. But that's one way of looking at it. And I suppose this is better than having the same situation in, say, 10 months from now, right? If we come back and it's like November, December of 24, and we find out, oh, look, they're fighting with Laney College, and it's like, oh, well, so they're basically doing a jackal speed run. Mm-hmm. Where you fight with the college that first was there, go and then you're going to go move to... And claim it's for yeah, the history. Some, How about this one? Yeah, for the history. It's just off the highway in a rough part of town, but don't worry about that. What's the parking like? Uh, we'll work on a deal with some of the neighboring warehouses. Like, you know, Mercury News is straight reporting that uh, talks between the bees and Laney fell apart over the team's request to build several thousand more seats of the school's scenic baseball field, which currently sits, sees 250. That was the whole premise. They, they fell apart not over the detail, it fell over the core idea. That's where I'm like, what? Either you, what are you doing? What are you saying? Are you just talking and then assuming that it'll just come to fruition for you? Or literally, are you so hard to work with that you were like, we want to expand your baseball stadium? They were like, yes. And then after working with you for a while, they're like, no. Or, I mean, it could be zoning, I guess. That could be the problem. But it does seem to be kind of between Laney. It, I mean, it, it, between them fell apart. Yeah, it yeah seems I mean, like, like it was Laney. the officials at the Peralta Community College District said that that's what caused the talks to fall apart. That's from the community college people. That, that's why earlier on I said it feels like a grade school class president situation. Because you remember back in grade school, whenever people would run and they'd be like, oh, well, we're going to have like a swimming pool on the roof and pizza Fridays and all this other weird stuff that you're like under no circumstance will adults actually allow that to occur. It feels like they came in like that. was like, oh, we're going to do all these upgrades. And we're going to have all these community outreach programs. And look, we're going to have this other sister team right here. And then there may be more teams coming. There could be so much here. The whole city's invested in it. And it's like, I don't doubt that there was a lot that was grounded in that. I don't doubt that prior to making that announcement, you had an agreement to make an agreement with Laney College and that both sides were interested in the proposal and were willing to advance it to an actual serious discussion phase. I have no doubt about that. I have no doubt that there was a lot of groundwork on a lot of projects here. Essentially, you already cleared the, the job site. And it was a matter of you started to put up the rebar and the actual skeleton of the thing and realized, wait a minute, we can't build here kind of a situation. In other words, they jumped the gun on a lot of stuff here. Thing. Um, and we do need to move on from this, but because this yeah. all could be for nothing. It could be fine, but it's just looking at local reporting, and I want to shout it out, that article I was looking at from the Mercury News, it they were on this on the 8th, actually. And of February or of, uh, of February. Because I, okay. Because I saw the one tweet that had the flyer saying about this from January 7th. Yeah. So, and if you go on to Reddit, there's a baller subreddit and an Oakland mm-hmm. subreddit that have been talking about this since the end of January, beginning of February. Hmm. That is very interesting for sure. Yeah. I, I mean, this reporting, I pointed out a couple interesting notes on it. It's just that um, the uh, do okay, heavily industrial part of West Oakland with warehouses and nameless office buildings. The closest bus stop is at an intersection flooded by trucks and vans lumbering into, onto Interstate 880, while the park itself has no available parking. That's a problem. Uh, yeah, past the concrete barriers and a tiny set of bleachers is a vast verdant and somewhat muddy athletic field and then starts to go on to the fact that they are sniffing around you know at the time so yeah so laney was already people from the uh peralta community college district were already at the time like yeah talks have fallen apart um but i mean we we knew about this like a few weeks ago i think so not that surprising um how about though look this might not necessarily be I'm going to give two sides real quick. Yeah, It might not necessarily be all on the ballers. It might not be at all. Um, the uh, last year, the men's soccer franchise, Oakland Roots SC, similarly abandoned its field at Laney over a field turf issue, opting to play at Cal State East Bay and Hayward while it searches for a semi-permanent home. Um, and then in the late tw- 2010s, 
the A's were trying to build a 35,000 seat stadium, but they shot that idea down. So like it's, yeah. So it's been an issue. Okay, boy, this is getting more interesting. Actually, I don't want to just read from the article, but um, yeah. it, so it does seem like Laney has a, a partially a reputation for chasing teams out, but also partially a reputation for being like, we don't need you. Um, and also how you should know that before you go in. Another interesting note is, uh, <laughs> oof, um, Raimondi Park, meanwhile, has been through hard times until last year. It was directly neighbored by Northern California's largest homeless encampment. Buddy, the largest in Northern California, that's like what Northern California does. Sorry to stereotype it. Like, shout San Francisco. This is and, notably bad. This is getting so much worse. I know. Now, but tenants were cleared by government officials in a painful process that concluded last year. The park is intrinsically light, linked to baseball. Uh, oh, God. All right. Wait, so Fine. they gave this homeless encampment the old Eric Adams special? Oh, yeah. No no word on whether or not baseball bats were involved, but I feel like it would have been appropriate. Um, oh, dude, refers to the Pioneer League as obscure. Not real friendly on that one. Tough scene. Yeah, wow. When they phrase it that way, it's tough. Franchise will compete in the obscure Pioneer League. Cheap where the players are not part of the major league farm system and where games are decided by home run derbies instead of extra innings. When you frame it that way, it feels bad. Got to be honest. Um, In fairness, though, mm. I will say to their credit, their website did crash from the demand for tickets after they've right. Oh, yeah. So they, they're doing something right. Yeah. So the fans want to go. They want to be there. They want to support this, but mm. it's like, you're not making it easy. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, that's it. It's right there for you. It's right there for you. Just don't, don't drop the ball. You're so close, dude. It, it's oh, they have the such ballers. they have such shut up. They have such a head start on every other organization. They have so much social media clout right now. They have so much attention. They have so many people talking about them. So They're selling tickets press. like crazy for a brand new organization that that is so hard to do. You might think new organization, everyone wants to see them. I'm telling you. Most indie ball teams, when they move to a new town and they're like, we're here, sell like trash. Like it is not good. They have so many advantages if they squander this. So help me God, Nick, I'm going to lose it. I could see uh, now. They're just going to put, I'm just going to see a random Instagram story post with an Oakland geo tag. It's just, yeah, it's not going to be good. I mean, you know, you know, you saw the Gastonia reporting. I'll go there. I'll get in. <laughs> Do a live on scene report. Dude, I yeah, I'm serious. Like I will be so mad. I don't know what else to say. I'm not trying to be super negative. It's just I don't know. So I'm gonna use this as my off ramp to transition into the final piece of news because we have an interview we do have to promote. Um Jack Jennings on the show, by the way. It's a good interview. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in any Fair. case, um, what lasts longer, the Oakland Ballers or Steve Montgomery's extension? Because he's now been extended to 2032, along with Bobby Post, hmm. who was the team's pitching coach, by the way. Nice. Uh, Steve Montgomery hangs around a while. I feel good about it. Yeah. So you think yeah. Montgomery outlives the Ballers? Um, oof. I don't know. That's close. Um, let me think here. Yeah. Extension. Mm, yeah, I think so. Dude, I'm not convinced that the A's don't outlast the ballers. Sorry. Yikes. It's, oh, it's not to go backwards. I'm just saying, I think the, I think the, if Oakland, if the A's hang out in Oakland for another two years, longer i i think the odds every day go up that they sell as the las vegas thing becomes a headache as he realizes this is going to be a mess no matter where i go when he realizes that he's going to have to go to salt lake city where who knows what beer sales look like i would sell it he's probably going to sell it he's going to do it in a way where the fans don't get to feel like they won whatever screw them but like and then what and then you sell to somebody the bigger fish the the 
the the big boy Paul Friedman, who will take his major league money and keep a team in Oakland, it folded overnight, dude. That's why. That's what I'm so worried about. I'm among everything else. Yeah, I'm worried about everything. I think I have like really either, crushingly but. anxiety, but that's fine. I'll work that out in therapy someday. But specific to the Oakland Ballers, I'm worried about a surprising amount. I just want they, to they occupy out. a lot of my thoughts. I want to point out while you're having like a small like coming to Jesus moment on mental health. I was trying to get a point in to say not only are beer sales going to be bad in Salt Lake City, but just a stereotype, just caffeine and soda. So I don't think that would sell well either. Mm, true. They love a root beer though. Um, it's Steve Montgomery. It's a good move. Yes. I mean, yes. we have no argument there. We, yeah. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Yeah. Uh, the, the, he's back. We probably rate yeah. him like a B plus or something. And, I just want to point out how Jack, uh, how, uh, Jack mentioned that in the interview, our C minus manager. And I was just like, that list is going to come back to bite us in the ass, still ain't it? Mm, yeah. Yeah, dude. It's uh, We're not done with that one. I oh, no. We're going to keep hearing about that one. It. Yeah. I got a few DMs already. <laughs> hmm. It's going to start to get bad during the season when the guys we rate highly do poorly and the guys we rated poorly do well. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a tough look for sure. Um, Plus, I would leave a B, by the way. Don't ever look up us on uh, Reddit. Oh, yeah? It's anxiety producing, yeah. Oh. We get kind of mentioned a good bit, I feel oh, like. That's not good. It's going to be fine, I think. Uh, so, Mongo, yeah, honestly. Again, probably the best you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Probably was waiting to sign that extension to the whole, you know, baseball element of it got worked out to make sure that they have a ballpark. Mm -hmm. Um, And once I got done, you know, no reason to not take care of it. So good for him for staying there. Good for the explorers. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Much more than that. It is the reason I circled right back to the ballers days conversation. So I was like, I like it. I don't know what else to say. It's just, it was a great move to make. I mean, it's a, almost a must, you know, the, the, he has the pre-existing relationship seems to be a good vibe. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we promote this interview and then we'll go from there. So we got an interview, Jake Jennings. He does baseball ops for the doc counts. We have any thoughts we want to say about it, or do we want to just say, here's the interview and then talk about it. Uh, yeah, something like that. I don't really have much else to add other than I was really happy. I didn't know him before this. I have never spoken to him and I had really enjoyable time and hopefully it didn't, you know, side track us too far talking about, uh, the ins and outs of baseball operations in the American Association. But yeah, man, had a good time. Very insightful as a young guy coming up, um, sort of straight into the deep end, really. So uh, yeah, man, good conversation. I hope people enjoy it. Yeah. See, that's the thing that always strikes me whenever we do, uh, these interviews and we start talking to people that are in baseball ops and then they're all like, Oh yeah, I'm 24. And it's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's like, Oh yeah, I forgot that like all these front office people are younger than me. Not by much, but like still, I, I forgot about that. So it is interesting, it's but it also tells jarring. me that. Like, yeah. Yeah. But at the same point in time though, it tells you like, okay, there's like, it's such a great ground for proving yourself. And like, there's a lot of younger people that are really talented at this. Yeah, no, you're right. It was through me. I was older than Coltac in Lexington. I was like, eh? <laughs> it just threw me off, man. I'm I'm ancient, apparently. In any of all uh, front office terms, I think I'm I'm ancient. In any case, why don't we go ahead and throw it to the interview we did with Jack Jennings, the director of baseball operations for the Lake Country Dog Council. We return with another interview in the long-running interview series, and this week we go back to both data and baseball, which we never really left from. That's how great I am at intros. In any case, you know who's actually got their job? The new director of baseball operations for the Lake Country Dock Hounds, Jack Jennings. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, guys. How are you doing? You know, getting good, by. Man. Yeah, you, you know. know. through the hardest part of this, which is me doing an intro, so that's good. Hey, I'm excited yeah. to be on. It's cool to hear my intro on this show. You know, after hearing so many other intros, listen to Mike Pinto's a few weeks ago. It's uh, it's cool. It's cool to get my own kind of in there. 
Yeah. And I, you were very complimentary of the show, which is the right way to start, but also not the best way to establish that you have good judgment. But we do appreciate the kind words prior to uh, getting this going here. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm excited to be talking to you because, uh, frankly, I we, we have not crossed paths. And yeah. I know very little about you. And that's fun because you very often either need to do the tell the audience about yourself, which is kind of a weird vibe. So this yeah. is just going to be me possibly asking stupid questions, but like very possibly being like, tell me about yourself. Yeah. Um, where were you born? No, uh, please don't start there. Um, but Nick, you and Jack were the first. You, Jack is your guest on your podcast. So I will uh, let you take back podcast. over if you want to start this uh, over before I really make the spiral out of control in the ways that I do. I suppose I could do that. I mean, you said I uh, may ask stupid questions. I mean, you may ask stupid questions. And I mean, that's no different from regular questions you ask. So, I mean, that's pretty standard around here. Uh, but yeah, so I guess like the best way to start off would be what was it like last year working with Lake Country? Obviously, it's, it was the second year of the team. And yeah. you're coming over from doing a little bit of work over in Milwaukee with the Milkman, not exactly one for one, but a little bit like that. So I guess what's the difference between the two uh, Wisconsin teams? Yeah, I mean, so with the Milkman, I was I was just in their retail. Um, yeah. So I just I just worked in their store and kind of helped with merchandise along with uh, the owner, Mike Zimmerman and his wife. And so. You know, that that was kind of what warmed me up to indie ball. You know, yeah. I, I'll say I'll start it out by saying I kind of fell in love with indie ball when I viewed the film uh, Battered Bastards of Baseball. Okay, talk yeah. about Port mm, Portland. That'll do it. Yeah, that, that'll, that'll catch you. So, yeah, I kind of fell in love with indie baseball then and then kind of started looking into the history, you know, really got into the Atlantic League. But obviously none of them, none of those teams were really around here. Uh, and then kind of found out about the American Association really when the Milkmen started coming around. So I had worked for, if you guys are familiar with the Northwoods League at all, yeah. I worked, yeah. So I started with the uh, Lakeshore Chinooks when I was 15. So I worked there uh, five total years. So it was about 16 to like 21. But in 2020, uh, obviously COVID canceled a lot of people's seasons. So I was kind of scrambling. I wanted to stay in baseball. wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And uh, one of somebody I'd worked with with the Chinooks had moved into a kind of leadership role over at the Milkmen. So sent a few emails and said, "Hey, are you just looking for some help, game day operations type stuff?" And then I joined, uh, you know, their operations staff in 2020. And then obviously got to be around that, you know, great championship team and. I kind of knew then that this was kind of the route that I wanted to go down and possibly be, you know, starting baseball operations within an indie league and then just kind of went from there. So, I mean, my role night and day from Milkmen to yeah. uh, Doc Hounds night and day, but it's been, it's been fantastic working with the Doc Hounds so far. I've, I've loved it. Yeah. And I, I definitely can see that. I imagine I shouldn't say what I imagine. I don't going to directly ask like, what was the exact moment or the exact uh, kind of through line that is appealing about indie ball to you? Cause I think it's going to be what I think it is. I mean, it'd be weird if it wasn't what yeah. I think it is, but yeah. 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 I mean, so I, so I guess I, I'd, I'd set up interviews with uh, both the milkmen and the doc hounds and then kind of fell cold with the milkmen. And then I looked at the dock hounds and they were an expansion team at that point and i didn't really know much about them and so i was like do you know what i think i'm gonna try and take a chance there and see you know if i can make something happen with that team and um you know i i love indie ball because you know it's 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 the wild west man every day it's you know i i can lose my whole team right after this interview or i could sign five guys like it's you know, you have to be ready at the drop of a dime to, you know, adjust and show that you can build a winning team. And I think that's a very important thing to do. I, I, I saw the cut in minor league baseball is a real tragedy and, you know, they're them cutting all that development. And I saw indie ball is kind of rising in importance and saw that this was a time that I kind of need to put my foot in the door. Yeah, no, I see that's part of the appeal has always been for me too. It's just like you don't necessarily know what to expect, but at the end of the day, you still have control over what's happening. Yeah. Is that you get to say, 
these are the guys I want on my team. These are the guys I'm going to have. And you know the objective walking in the door every day is my goal is to make sure we win baseball games and that we're running a good organization. And those are really the only two things that matter as opposed to on that affiliate level where it's like, look, winning isn't important. And that's just such like for any competitor, anyone that played a sport or anything, anyone that really has some sort of a drive is like winning and wanting to be the best should be at the top of the list of things that you walk in doing. Like, why am I going to walk in to an industry that's inherently competitive on every level and most aspects of that industry and not want to go out and produce the best product here? And uh, I'm not going to speak to you, but I imagine that's what really is uh, uh, drawing to baseball ops to have that control and be able to really be able to put your stamp on a team especially a young team like uh, like the Doc Hounds. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I saw that, you know, obviously the Milkmen won a championship. Anthony Barone is a great manager. They're very well run over there. They they know how to do they know how to do it. Um and so I, you know, obviously the Doc Hounds struggled in their first opening season as, you know, pretty much every expansion team does. Um, and so, yeah, I, I saw an opportunity to not only put my, a stamp on things and really be able to help control a roster, but, you know, also I saw a, a possibility to make a difference within baseball. And I, I thought any ball was really kind of the route to do that. Um, and, and I don't want to say that, you know, minor league guys don't want to win, win games and, you know, mm-hmm. advance in double A, but there is there's restrictions because obviously if you're a major league team you don't want a guy throwing 115 pitches to get a win but at the same time as a competitor he might so i think it not only blends the minor league baseball atmosphere that everyone knows and loves but also combines it with like you said a really winning culture and every night the 25 guys that you have are the only goals to win the game yeah, and that that's what's uh, just so great about it is developing that culture too, and that's part of it. And uh, I don't want to take up too much time because I know Ryan's going to want to jump in, obviously, and I don't want to steal all his questions from him because I'm sure they wouldn't be stupid questions. But, mm-hmm. I, but <laughs> I do want to throw at least one more out here, which is to talk about last year how it was a bit of a rough, rough start, rocky start, and then there was a really strong middle stretch, about 60 or so games, where the team really came alive, especially after the managerial switch, where it was like, oh, okay, this is a much different team. So I wonder if you could just take us through that little stretch of time there, really from when they flicked the switch and really got it going through the rest of the year there. Yeah, yeah. So I can just kind of take you guys on a little story of kind of our season. So obviously I, I started out, I interviewed for the position in January of this past year. Um, so I, I came on pretty late in the off season um, and basically just said, you know, I, I brought a list of guys who I had scouted and said, you know, I, I think these guys can help us win. I think there is a championship team that we can put together. Um, and throughout the off season, I think there was just, I think there was a difference of approach in the way we were roster building between, uh, I would just say everywhere. I I just think we didn't do a great job at trying to put the best team on the field. Um, And so our our first manager was let go at the beginning of the year, uh, only eight games into the season. Obviously we had struggled uh, the year before and then started two and six. So that was, that was a little rough. That was tough. I mean, my, my intro to indie ball, my opening day was losing 17 to four. We were, uh, mm-hmm. we were down 11, nothing in the third inning. So it was, mm, uh, yeah. Day. Yeah. It was, it was a tough day. I didn't really text many friends and family that score uh, yeah. that night, but um, yeah. So it, obviously we, we went through the managerial change and it was, you know, most of the staff had left as well. Um, so two weeks, two weeks into my first pro job, it's, you know, myself, uh, our owner, Tom Kelnick and our pitching coach, Paul Wagner. And that was the room. Uh, so uh, Wags, Wags was an interim coach for a little yeah. bit. And then uh, we found Huck and yeah. he was, you know, I, Huck, Huck is fantastic. I, I can't agree with that C minus. I know he's not listening. I'm <laughs> sure he's not offended, but um, yeah. no, he's, he's a fantastic manager. Um, you know, and so I, I think, I think we, 
like I said, we didn't do a fantastic job at the beginning of the year uh, putting together our roster. I think not only did I not do the best job, I just don't think I expressed, you know, my opinions enough. Um, so it, the turning point was kind of, I, I realized we needed more offense. Um, and along with Ken uh, Huckabee, we brought Reggie Harrison as a bench coach. Reggie, great guy. Uh, former MLB pitcher, he had been in Gastonia the year before. So he uh, hooked me up with Brady. And so Brady and I got to talking and Brady, great for Gastonia. Great. Yeah, I mean, he he's going to do a fantastic job down there, always has. Um, so last year, during the middle of the year, we kind of got talking. Uh, and I mean, yeah, it was it was a season full of learning. So our um, our right fielder, Nick Banks, who was an all star, uh, he decided to hang him up. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciated him for giving us ample time to kind of prepare for that. Um, you know, he let us know that his heart really just wasn't in it. And, you know, he needed to move on to the next chapters of his life. And, you know, when guys tell me that, I, I yeah. totally understand. So um, I've been talking to Brady for a few weeks about their right fielder, Stephen Sensley. Um, we kind of got talking a little bit more. I said, hey, I might need even more. You know, what can you offer me? Um, and so we ex ended up expanding the trade and I got, uh, David Richardson and Curtis Terry as well in the deal. And that's kind of when our, we had a lot of really good hitters on our team, but we lacked power. And so that yeah. was kind of, I think the turning point in our season, but yeah, we started four and 13 ended two and 15 and right in that part, right in that middle part, we yeah. were pretty dang good, but, um, yeah, it was, it was a learning season. It was, it was a lot of tough moments, but. I think that's just preparing us even better for this next year. Yeah, no, it was at Solid Foundation. There's a lot of growth in that season. That's exactly what you're looking for going from year one to year two and now going year two to year three. You're really primed for it. And especially with the way that the playoff system works in the American Association, as long as you can just be slightly better than that this year, just avoid that two and 15 stretch, you're yeah. in. And once you're in, Anything can happen. That's the fun of baseball. You just need one good week and then, hey, you're off to a championship series. So, um, yeah, yeah, we caught, we caught a just a, that two and 15 stretch. We caught a tough break. I think we had Chicago on the road, Kansas City on the road. Yeah, um, we, lost, we lost two starters to, I think, Taiwan in that process. So it was just, it was just kind of an all out, you know, yeah. It, it fell apart, but it all know, hit the worst time. It all hit yeah, the same it, time. Yeah, yeah a hundred percent. So Brian, I'll throw it back over to you. So that way I don't monopolize too much time here. I'll let you uh, jump in and get some high quality questions in. Yeah. I had a, a few thoughts throughout that, which is, I mean, my opening weekend, what turned out to be my only opening, I mean, only weekend really uh, as baseball operations in Lexington, uh, we lost three out of four to the ducks. So, you know, it happens sometimes. Yeah. Could have moved man, those tickets on Facebook. Could have got another weekend. Dude, thank God for Courtney Hawkins to walk off home or at least to, to get me one. Um, <laughs> okay. Good Lord. Uh, so I think I'm sitting on a two and four career record for baseball ops. So, you know, okay. keep it in mind. Um, <laughs> not to, not to flex, but, uh, the, uh, man, I don't even know where to start. Cause I, you actually remind me of a bunch of different things just while you were talking there. So, um, I, I while I will, of course, have to ask at some point about American Association roster rules. I will yeah. hold that for now. Um, I will first shout out the fact that uh, your trade partner there, Brady Salisbury, will be on our next episode. Oh, so that's nice. a nice little segue there. I appreciate that. Uh, now, so you, you sort of give the background how you end up in baseball operations there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm trying to even figure out the, 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 the do you mind if I ask, how old are you? <laughs> Uh, I'm 23. Dude, young guys in indie ball baseball ops. Yeah, I don't know what yeah. to take from it. I take it as a, I don't know like that's supposed to be taken as a win. Is, is like 25. I know, I'm like deep down, no offense. I know it's because, you know, young guys are seen as cheaper, but yeah. I do think it's good. I think it's really yeah. good for the game. Like I, I love indie ball as like a front office development role too. It's, it's a yeah. great thing. So that's, it makes me happy, even if that's not the intent of ownership, <laughs> which I don't know what it is going. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, okay. So first, I mean, how has that response been? Um, yeah, 
I guess there's a couple things. So the response from fans, but then the response from the player side, because, uh, you know, Lake Country, that's a, a new vibe, a new ballpark there. Uh, so have you seen, you know, the local area respond well to indie ball or with some hesitation? And how has it been sort of getting guys comfortable there? Because I know there's, from baseball operations side, you know, to the logistics of getting guys there and comfortable, it can be a never ending list. So how, how's sort of the settling in process been since you weren't there maybe from day one, but you have been there from pretty early on here? Yeah. I mean, I, I can only say that most of the, and we had 65 guys in 120 days for a hundred games. So it was, it was a lot, but I, I can say that, you know, I feel like everybody who's come into Lake Country and been a part of our program and been on our team has really enjoyed their time, honestly. Um, we have a great host family program, um, you know, so a lot of families who are season ticket holders who attend a lot of the games, they host players throughout the season, sometimes even two or three at a time. Um, so the community has been responding great. I mean, attendance numbers are pretty good, especially I think they were higher year one, I believe. Um, you know, obviously the thrill of a new team kind of checking it out. Um, but obviously the success on the field didn't really come with it. And so, uh, you know, I think we're doing a great job marketing out in Oconomowoc in, you know, the greater you know, kind of Milwaukee area going around Waukesha, uh, you know, all those cities out there. I think the local communities responded great. You know, I think we have a great game day atmosphere, um, you know, very friendly people all around the stadium. And so far, players have come back with nothing but, you know, good responses. And even guys who we've had signed, you know, to Mexico or to other places, we still are able to keep in contact with them. And, they reach out to us and say, Hey, we, you know, we have a friend who just got released, uh, you know, by this team, he's looking for a place to play. We gave him your suggestion. So, you know, the fact that we have guys who keep coming back and keep helping us out, even throughout, throughout, you know, other off seasons where they don't necessarily need to, I, I see that as a sign of success. And, you know, cause obviously if you're not going to suggest a place to a friend, if you know, you don't feel like you had a good situation there. So, um, you know, Huck, he managed for a long time in the minor leagues. He was supposed to manage in triple a Buffalo. And then I think some happened with COVID, um, wags pitched in the big leagues, uh, you know, Dave Pano minor league hidden coordinator for the blue Jays for a long time. So, we, you know, we, we bring a wealth of experience and, you know, uh, our owner, Tom Kelnick, obviously his son, Jared is on the Braves. His other son, JT is playing baseball, Grand Canyon. So both, both his kids are players and, you know, he sees, he sees his kids and all these players and obviously wants the best for their careers and wants them to move up in, you know, levels and competition and pay. And, you know, that's, that's my goal too. So obviously, we see it as a symbiotic relationship. We want guys to come in here, do well, and then go out somewhere else and do even better. So that's kind of our goal. And, you know, I think we've had a really good, good experience getting guys in and, you know, training them and, you know, kind of just working with them. Okay. That's, I mean, that's really what it is too. You kind of need the community there and, for the players and then you also kind of need the players for the community too when it comes to mm-hmm. warming everybody up at the organization so good to see that hasn't had a lot of growing pains at least um now from now we're going to get in the weeds that was my general question yeah. sorry about it um i'm fascinated by the american association's uh roster restrictions because i think they're probably the most complicated ones to navigate probably in all of american pro ball i figure because i can't really think of anybody else who would compete with that so uh, what uh, let's a race last season, then we'll go with from, yeah. And so we'll call it end of the 2023 season. What's priority one when it comes to attacking your off season, putting a roster together, uh, is it, you know, figuring out who's getting contract extensions? Yeah. So I, I would, I would say it's, you know, you, you try and find a piece to build off of. Um, okay. So obviously we won't be bringing back everyone from last year. That's just how the business goes. And I don't think I'm doing a good job if we are, because the way I see it, we should have guys signing 
to, you know, other places. Demetrius Sims, Marcus Chu, Hohanse Torres, they all signed in Mexico. Austin Davis, he signed with the San Diego Padres. Um, so you kind of learn each and every day. I mean, I've probably had 200 mock rosters by February <laughs> 16th. So it's it's kind of just fitting the puzzle pieces along and seeing, okay, right today I have this roster. What would I do to fill this roster if I had the chance to end it today? And that's kind of just how I go. And that's that's kind of how I reach out to guys too. Um, you know, we have target boards and, uh, you know, free agent lists that we're combing over, going through statistics, going through, you know, velocities, reaching out to coaches. Um, so I, I would say, you know, in the roster rules have changed a little bit. I don't know if that if you're aware of that. So now we have it's six veterans uh, per team. You mm -hmm. have to have five rookies or LS ones. And they there used to be a bunch of distinction between the LS two and threes and then the four and fives. You could only have so much. There's none of that in the middle anymore. So yeah, it's that's it's, gonna help out logistically, I'm sure. Yes, it a hundred percent does. And and I th I think it's a good thing the American Association did that. I, I can't say enough good things about Josh Schaub. I I think he's done a fantastic job as commissioner. Um and yeah, it just really gives us more flexibility in building a roster and saying, Hey, if I have four guys who are LS fours, you know, I, I might not be able to sign this guy. Cause he's also a four, or, you know, we have, we already have two fives and, and it just really, it, it not only brings down the competition, but it brings down the creativity. And so, you know, I think it, it allows us to keep our rosters young one by keeping that rookie LS one rule, but also, allows us to, you know, if, if we want to get six veterans and then a few guys who are kind of skating right under, we, you know, we're allowed to do that. Yeah. I, I mean, how many times does it happen where you're like, Oh, this would be a great fit. I think we make it work. And you'd look at the roster, his roster classification. You're like, yeah. Oh, you're kidding me. I can't imagine how often that must've went down. Yeah, it was. And that was, that was something where I think it got changed mid off season. It, it got okay. changed in some league meetings, I think. So when I first started uh, last January, that mm -hmm. was one of the things that was on. And then all of a sudden, kind of mid off season, it was like, okay, you don't need to worry about these middle parts as much. And it was like, oh, well, in that case, you know, <laughs> we, we, we can get a lot more creative here. So, yeah. yeah I mean, a lot more creative by choice, not by yeah. cre not creative yeah. by like yeah. the, uh, Force. I was going to say that the best, you know, things for creativity are having the infinite budget or having two cents. 100%. So it is nice sometimes to not yeah. be worth two cents when it comes to at least the room you have on the roster. Um, now, speaking of the complications on the roster, the newest complication, and, and Nick, we only mentioned it in passing, I think, at this point on the pod, yeah. but I know I'm going to want to talk to Brady about it next week. Uh, might as well talk to you from the American uh, wait, Association Mexico? perspective. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, I do not, do you not. Okay. I was wondering if you were like, oh, I was going to talk about it. Okay. You're cool. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, are you seeing, uh, so for listeners who aren't aware, Mexican, the Mexican league has sort of, freed up their uh, restrictions on how many Americans can play on the team. It's not that simple. It's sort of how they define uh, American citizenship versus Mexican citizenship. So uh, without getting too in the weeds on that part, when it comes to the end result, which is, you know, how it is signing and keeping players in American Indie ball, ha have you been feeling that effect at all? Have you been seeing any sort of uh, difficulties coming up that might have not existed before that change? Yeah, so I think um, la last year the Mexican League there's there's a lot of movement. Uh, mm -hmm. You know their rosters. They you know you can be there and gone in two weeks. Um, this off season, yeah, it's I've seen a significant rise in players going to Mexico, especially in guys where I felt comfortable in our target list in our league. I have seen a ton of guys sign in Mexico and, and I, you know, that's great for them. That's, that's what we're here for. Um, so I think there's 18 teams in the league, I want to say, and it went from six to 20. So that's around mm -hmm. roughly 200, 250 players. Mm -hmm. So not only is AAA getting poached, 
Frontier League, Atlantic League, you know, American Association. Um, so it, it's been tough. It's been tough to kind of find out where the perfect middle ground is. Um, you know, I, I felt comfortable with lots of double A guys going, you know, in the past off season. Now it's more of a threat for them to go to Mexico. Um, and so that's, that's one, I guess, challenge and complication that I didn't really expect this off season. Um, but yeah, it's, it's also been, we just don't, I don't see too many Mexican league transactions going down. It's they're kind of hard to track. So, mm -hmm. you know, once, once a guy goes to Mexico, it's kind of, it's on them to get back in because we, we don't, we don't, I don't really know unless, unless an agent reaches out or you've, you know, where to go in indie ball. Most of the time, I don't really know if you've been released or not. Um, and so that's, that's just kind of one tough thing about, you know, dealing with Mexico is kind of a new hurdle to get guys into indie ball. But I mean, if you guys have seen kind of their stadiums, their atmosphere, mm -hmm. um, I mean, players get paid more. It's, it, I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that, you know, we brought a few guys in, uh, you know, and obviously they weren't making Mexico money on our team and we got to send them there this off season. So, you know, I, I, th I think it's a good thing and a bad thing. It's, it just we need to get better. That's that's pretty much the only thing is, you know, it's a new hurdle. There's always going to be hurdles in indie ball. And there's if, if you don't think that's the last hurdle that's coming, I have, I have bad news. There's more. But, um, yeah, it's just another thing that we have to deal with. But, you know, I, I think it's fantastic for players and, you know, it's it's a unique opportunity. Yeah, uh, I'm, I know I'm hearing a lot from baseball operations and from managers just struggling to find pitching in particular. I know you have had luck. You found at least based on what I got, like five or at least four free agents. And then you got, I know you saw Augie Voigt, who I've seen plenty of through the Atlantic League. So uh, you're finding your guys where you can, but is that really where you're, you're feeling it too? Or, or are you feeling it? You know, every once in a while, depending on what you're looking for and what the situation is. Some, people come out of left field and be like, dude, I can't find an outfielder, like literally out of left field. And, and I'm like, what? But <laughs> So I know it varies, but it, I mean, have you found the, the crunch to be on pitching and what's your, everyone has different theory on why, if you have any, I'm always down to listen. Yeah, no. So, I mean, my, my theory is, is that um, especially as pitchers, you can go into these new facilities, tread, um, you, you know, the, there's so many to name, like it's, you can go anywhere pretty much. And the fact that you can kind of get all of these numbers now, you know, spin rate, inverted break, everything on these pitches, you can sign up for six month programs. So if there's these programs, it's less incentive for you to go figure it out in indie ball where you can go figure it out in a facility. And if affiliate teams are telling you, oh, you know, we, we need to see your velocity jump or we need to see this on one of your pitches or you need to add a fourth pitch or, you know, something like that. You can do it in a controlled environment, which I think is a lot less injury risk. Um, and so since you can put out this film and you can up your velocity and change pitches and I think create a much more diverse profile, I'd say, than like a hitter. Because obviously you have, you know, exit velocities and you have a lot to go off of that. But a lot of that is still in season stuff that you're going off of. So I think pitchers just like to hold out longer. I think it it makes more sense for them to hold out longer because not only not only that, but injuries, arm injuries are way up. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to sit out, you might as well wait for spring training and then see what happens. But I think another interesting obstacle is uh, the MLB cut their spring training invites this year. Mm -hmm. um, so about 30, I, I want to say it's 30, 35 less spots than last year. So it's, it's, been, it's been an interesting offseason. And I think that's why it's been so slow is because I think a lot of people are just trying to figure out what's going on. Like it's there's there's a changing landscape both at the top and at the bottom i'd say yeah i'm glad to hear you say all that because that has been 
I think the you are already on top of the hard truth that I've found a lot of people not wanting to acknowledge because a lot of it was like, well, you know, it's just the the money or it's just the, you know, it, we're just competing with these teams that have more resources or whatever. Uh, but I do think a lot of it is what you said. It's uh, pitchers can basically show and go. I always use the Roger Clemens thing, and he was coming from being out of shape. He had to do some, you know, minor league stints. But like that one year where he was just like, "Yeah, I'm just going to pitch at home, and I'm not going to travel with the team or whatever." It, like you can get away with that as a pitcher. You can't yeah. really do that. And and with pitching, it's so unique where it, you don't really need sample size to see a guy's stuff. Meanwhile, if a guy is raking, you're like, "Yeah, but it's been a week. Like, what ballpark was he playing in that weekend?" Like. It's it is a very different thing, and where you know, <laughs> I've I've heard the complaint from the player side too of like pitchers can show up, throw two games, strike out five guys, and they're like, all right, bye. And you're a hitter, and that same weekend, you know, you go, you know, eight for ten with four walks and two homers, and everyone's like, yeah, we'll check back in in a month. <laughs> and they're like, bro, that's like six bus rides. Um, so it is fascinating to hear, you know, from that perspective that you are seeing that part of it too. Um, yeah. It, it not gonna be the last challenge. If you could, this would be my last thing. I'll kick back to Nick and get out of the woods. I promise. It's if you said, and I agree. What's it's not gonna be the last complication. Do you have any predictions on what could be the future complications people in your role are dealing with? Ooh, that's that's, that's a tough an, one. I that's know. an interesting one. I don't. Hey, I don't mind being in the woods because I like talking <laughs> about. I like talking about the depths of indie ball. But um, Nick, I can just call you when this is done. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, you know, whatever works we, for you. I've kept it out of the analytics side, and you're welcome. Look, um, look I know it's your show. I don't want to interrupt your show. <laughs> you do, Well, you brought a baseball ops guy on. I don't know what to tell you. Um, yeah, 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 but, man, I would say... I, I would say pay is pay is always going to be uh, pay is always going to be a challenge. But then again, so not everyone wants to go play in another country. A lot of people have, you know, uh, families and you know children and all, all kinds of stuff that prevents you from just upping your life and going for five six months a year. Uh, so so I would say I think the biggest challenge is going to be w- it the competition might be a little bit more evened out than we are going to expect. You know, I don't know if it's going to be as much of super teams anymore. I don't Mm -hmm. know if there's going to be, I think it's going to be harder for teams to hold standards for as long because the way I see it is I, I think MLB will eventually cut more minor league teams. I think that will at some point yeah. happen and there's going to be another level. The spring training invites are another indication. They don't want to pay for, you know, the development of a lot of these guys. They want finished products or to train on your own. Um, so I think, I think not only with the amount of indie ball teams we have, cause I mean, now we're talking frontier, we're talking American Association. We're talking Atlantic League. There's a few other feeder leagues kind of out there. Um, with some of the top talent now going overseas and just the plethora of teams around here, uh, you know, I see a problem with there's only 20 rounds of Major League Baseball draft. So is any ball going to shift more into straight college baseball straight from bigger programs and guys who may have had bigger competition versus a double a guy who was struggling. Mm -hmm. So I I kind of see that there, there might be, we we might need to expand the pay at some point. And, you know, that's, that's way above me. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, I think there's also an expansion of a lot of leagues, which has been surprising to me. Um, And so you know, I, I think that the talent, it'll, it's just moving so fast. That's, I think that's the problem. And, and, you know, there's only so much you can do as an indie league to kind of hold the players rights. Cause obviously you want them to go and play at bigger levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think meanwhile, they're going to be balancing all of that. I think the leagues are going to have to make sure they balance the amount of talent, like on both sides of the ball. Cause we see the offense and pitching bounce as well in the Atlantic, the frontier and the American, but pioneer is where it starts to have trouble where you start to run into, there's more pitchers than hitters or uh, more hitters than pitchers. As we talked about, And if you can't balance that, it's going to become very difficult to, 
you know, bring people in. But that's yeah. that's fascinating, man. Have you thought at all about like, I mean, how much you guys stress? I mean, you you do the host family thing, so that, that varies. Is there any way that you can kind of ensure player amenities or quality of, you know, not quality of life necessarily, but kind of quality of life? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, in, in the host families, they have, you know, there's some beautiful homes. I mean, the guys, we, we did not have one complaint last year. So that that was fantastic. The community stepping up and, you know, the, they're they're a very big part of our team. Um, and, you know, so I think that's housing has kind of almost been an afterthought, which a lot of guys don't really get that luxury. So, no. Yeah, that's that's been fantastic. Is I, I think we have a really good host family program, um, and then yeah, it's 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 been fantastic on that side. So obviously, I know Atlantic League, you kind of have to pay for your own housing. Um, so that's most most of the time, if you're a player, they'll either cut it out of your contract or you have to pay on the side. At least for us, we we you get the money from your contract, and you don't have to worry about housing. So I, I think that's one thing that's kind of leaning our way, but, um, you know, obviously that, that can change at any time. Interesting. Nick, before I kick it to you, the, the reason I, I, I've been asking down that line of questioning, and I'm going to do it again next week and I promise is, uh, I, my theory is I think player amenities is the future NIL. I think it's like for indie ball because, you know, you can only push the salary cap so much, but if you want an edge on somebody like we, I've seen players go to one place or another just because they'd rather, you know, be in their housing situation. So it'll be interesting to watch then the differences between some. So good. I'm glad to see. What is it? Uh, I'm going to try it. Okanamawak. Okan. Oh, Okanamawak. Oh, dude, I was way off. Yeah. Way off. That's I, the I, next thing is butchering some pronunciation. So I, I took the heat on that one. Damn. It was two, two things. So it was, it was funny that I think Quick Trip did a video with Rob Gronkowski uh, trying to, pronounce wisconsin cities nice and oh, one no. of them was oconomowoc and i think it was it was pretty close to yours i'll, I'll say oh, okay so, well i don't know if that's what i want right online <laughs> gronks <laughs> you, what i just heard was you got compared to a super bowl champion that's what i yeah, heard that's i got that's compared I to saying. someone else who used to play a contact sport with concussion problems and so <laughs> i don't know about it you read yeah, that but, differently than i did there yeah but he he made money on it you didn't it's some easy there easy there um i, I, I will kick it's back to nick hey hey nick yeah. it's your show man back to you that's nice i <laughs> i don't want to further insult the former semi-pro rugby player <laughs> hey man i was on the pro side of semi-pro and that counts for something i don't know what it certainly doesn't help with anything that i have seen but you know paid a check or two any case there. so i'm gonna actually bring us back to baseball now from yeah. that like tangent and uh we were talking a little bit about the difference between the Atlantic and the American here. I just wonder, especially with more of the upper end players, do they probably have some options here? Partially, what's the pitch like to try and get them into a lake country? And then the other part of it is, how does that really compare to, say, more or less the some of these Atlantic teams? I'm sure are coming calling for some guys as well. Yeah, no, it's 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 uh it's funny. Me and uh me and Brady texting back like, hey man, you just you just signed this target off my list. What the hell? Come on. Yeah. But um no, I, I would say in in we have a we have a smaller salary cap than the Atlantic League per month. Um so that's obviously a battle where you know we're not able to get as many triple A guys and you know, some of these some of these guys who are like towards, you know, have, have played five or six years major league ball. Uh, a, a very Long Island Ducks type player. We're not <laughs> always we're not always in in the running for those guys, unfortunately. As much as I'd love to, um, but no, we play. I mean, we play in a state of the art facility, Wisconsin Brewing Company Park. If you haven't seen pictures, uh, indoor Olympic sized training facility within the stadium. We have batting cages within the stadium. Uh, you know, there's there's a brewery within the club level, which is pretty cool. Uh, so, I mean, we just, I think we do a great job in saying that, you know, you get a great host family once you're here, so you don't have to worry about housing. Uh, you're well taken care of. You get fantastic coaching from top to bottom. We've had guys who have major league experience, major league coaching experience, minor league coaching experience. And then for, you know, we play in a smaller park. Um, so for a lot of the offensive guys, it's, Hey, we, 
we see a formula in your statistics that we think you would come here and you would blow numbers out the water. So I think for hitters, that's a really, you know, not an easy sell, but it's, it's a much easier time to guys that, Hey, I think with, you know, our staff and our park that we can put you in a really good spot. Uh, and then pitchers, you know, obviously we we have a lot of we have wags who pitched in the major leagues for a very long time. Great pitching coach. Um, last year we had Reggie as well. Um, and it's it's been, you know, hey, you you you're going to pitch in a uh, hitters park. You're going to face pretty good competition. Uh, I mean, the past few years, there's been a lot of teams who have put out some damn good lineups. Um, so, yeah, it's you're pitching in hitters park. Um, you know, you're going to face good comp. And if you put up good numbers, people are going to realize that. Um, and, you know, we've we've had that success. And, you know, I think that's another thing that we've been able to kind of show to guys is, you know, hey, Randall Delgado and Kyle McGowan, we had them signed in Taiwan. Uh, Luis Avilas, um, Nick Howard, uh, Nick Harold. Um, uh, and I think a few other names are slipping my mind. We sent them back to affiliate. We sent three guys to Mexico. Uh, I think Brian Ray is also might also be going to Mexico. I'm not 100 percent sure on that. But yeah, so I mean, we've we've shown guys that hey, this isn't this isn't the last stop. This is a stop. Uh, we want to get your numbers up. We want to help fix any kinks that. Uh, an affiliate team saw and then hopefully move you on to the next spot. And so I think we've done, not only do we have a pretty good track record of it in two years, but I'm hoping the winning is going to come along in this third year and, you know, the, the right formula will be put together. Yeah. And I imagine a lot of the kind of ideal team construction built off of who may, who you managed to draw with the pitch and also because of that pitter friendly ballpark, that's something you definitely want to, really focalize in your uh, roster construction there. So is that obviously we talked earlier about how you can have a clean slate every year, practically when you go in there, is that part of it? Like, okay, I definitely want to have more offensive minded guys or guys where I'm like, yeah, I know he has a tendency to hit to the part of the park. I want him to hit towards or something along those lines. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, like when I'm, when I'm looking at pitcher profiles, I'm, I'm looking at the guys with the higher ground ball rates, hundred percent. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at pull percentage. I'm looking to, uh, you know, what types of pitches they have. You know, I found that some work better than others in our park. Uh, you know, I watch a lot of film and then kind of see, okay, if this, if this was in our stadium, what would have happened? Um, so, you know, I, I think it's we do a really good job and a really thorough, you know, job of going through video, going through statistics um, and looking at kind of everybody's profile and saying, you know, I think this particular guy is going to work well because of X, Y and Z. Um, and, and to that, you know, we have a really short right field, um, you know, left handed hitters do very well in our park. Um, is that a focus i'd i would say no um just because it it runs pretty short down the lines both sides but is it a bonus 100 percent. you know if if i have a right-handed hitter versus a left-handed hitter they're very similar in everything i can see i'm probably going lefty just because i feel like in the stadiums that we're going to be in that's going to benefit us way more yeah i definitely can feel that and that that reminds me of something or I thought of a question while you were talking there, which is, has there been a guy that you've seen play either in the association or a relatively comparable league that you said, you know, watching him play, I really would like him, tried to get him in this, couldn't get a deal done? Or has there been oh, one guy like that, similar to that? I mean, ooh, I mean, how, how much time you have? Uh, I've reached out, <laughs> reached out to a lot of people. No, I mean, uh, I one of, one of the bigger swing and miss, not swing and misses, yeah. but uh, I mean, I reached out to Chris Davis, uh, former Brewer, played yeah. in Kentucky. Um, uh, who are who are some? Of the, I know before I was there, we reached out to Eric Thames. Okay. Um, man, there's there's a few. I I did reach out to Courtney Hawkins. I I tried to see what he was about if he was interested. Uh, and then yeah, before before I got a chance, Adam Brett Walker went to. Uh, uh-huh. 
So, okay. yeah, yeah, no, I, I would have loved to get the hometown little crosstown signing, but oh my God. Uh, unfortunately, no, he's doing he's doing great over in Japan. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I mean that that's the thing is I I could probably name a hundred. I mean, we leave no stone unturned. We go for the crazy signing. We you know, obviously we try and be calculated and not waste our time. But, you know, if we think there is something there, we, we're not going to be afraid to take a shot. And yeah, no, I just imagine now you've managing to pull Walker away from Barone and him showing up to your door with the bat in hand. Go, you know, why are you taking my star hitter? Yeah, no, no. I mean, hey, I, that's, yeah. that's more of a dream after, after yeah. seeing ABW hit all those home runs at Franklin field. Yeah. I was like, man, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a day one good signing? So yeah. Uh, but no, he's, he's doing great. And, uh, yeah, no, they run a great program over there. Exactly. I mean, if you, you lose nothing by asking, so you might as well ask hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, I don't think I have too much else that's pressing here. I mean, like the, I will say there is one question I am extremely curious about, which is we know the Atlantic league, they have their weird rules and whatnot. And they do the rule testing that seems to be coming more or less to an end fairly soon, or at least not as extreme as it used to be. I do want to know, do you use that at all in a pitch to a guy where it's like, look, we're going to play baseball pretty straight up. It's like, you know, it. it's like how it's done in the major league level. We're not doing anything crazy. You don't have to worry about us, you know, doing something stupid, like, I don't know, moving the mound back or something like that. It's that kind of one of the ways you get more veteran guys that have some experience that their goal is very much, hey, I want to get back to AAA. I want to get back to the MLB level. Uh, not, not too much. Um, yeah. you know, I would, I would say if, if, if you're a triple A guy and yeah. you know, you're focused on the Atlantic league and you're focused on the Atlantic league salary yeah. and kind of what you think you're worth. Yeah. A lot of times, most teams, unless it's the very top of our payroll are not going to be able to compete. Yeah. Um, and so I think the rule changes are one thing that we definitely could dip into, but uh, for the most part, we just try and say, you know, everything great that we can about our organization and how we think we can help you. And, um, you know, we, we just, I, I don't, I don't tend to like to, you know, go into funky stuff like that and try and get them, you know, really thinking, okay, about the mound and all kinds yeah. of stuff. I just try and give them a good rundown of what our situation is like and, you know, the successes we've had. And, you know, I think the American Association has done a really good job of getting players contracts purchased in the past few years compared to the Atlantic League. And so so I think that's another big thing is just, hey, we're we're on par with them. You know, yeah. it's it's no different over here. We're we're committed to winning just like they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just always curious about how the pitches are because I know we talked to a lot of people and a lot of them are like I like to mention, like, you don't have to worry about it. So I'm just always curious about how each front office does things because I have heard other front offices doing something similar to that. Yeah, I mean, it's in, I, I don't know if that yeah. does play any, because obviously we signed, so we signed Kyle McGowan uh, yeah. last year towards the end of our playoff race yeah. or, you know, yeah. playoff run to, uh, towards the hunt. Um, so he was in Staten Island start the year uh, yeah. with Eric Shuffler and all those guys. And, yeah. Um, so he was signed by Houston after one game. We had signed Austin Davis, who was also from that uh, tri uh, AAA. Uh, what is that? Um, can't believe. Oh, uh, Sugarland, AAA okay. Sugarland. So yeah, Austin Davis was teammates there with McGowan. Uh, we hope to pair them and you know make our playoff run uh, with those two guys at the top of our rotation. So I mean, yeah, Kyle did go Atlantic to American. I don't know if that had any you know, yeah. bearing on his decision. I think it was more teammate, but yeah. And then uh, he pitched on Sunday at one o'clock and uh, signed by a Taiwanese team at four. So that was kind of how that <laughs> we went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess I'll throw it back to Ryan if he has anything else left to ask, because I know we're getting kind of tight towards the end of the hour. And I know uh, I don't want to take any more of your time than we have to. So. No worries. Um, I mean, I always have more questions, but that might just have to be on the back end. Now it, you're going to get DMs from me. It is with, um, that, that's fine. But, hey, I got some time. So if you need some more content, <laughs> I can definitely stay on. Well, maybe you'll pop on with, uh, on the Indie Ball Nation stuff once, you know, who knows? Okay. Maybe I'll do my own content and not just live here, like some sort of squatter <laughs> in the walls. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the only thing that was really on, on my mind in particular was, um, 
more about, I guess, uh, <laughs> it's such a can of worms. I don't even know if I can fully start to, to unpack it. But um, when it comes to backing up to the off-season strategy, I mean, yeah. do you look multiple years in advance or do you just handle things as it comes sort of? I asked a similar question to Mike Pinto when he was on. Yeah, I'm just fascinated by, you know, certain, you know, baseball operations departments seem to just take the day as it comes. We'll worry about the future in the future. Nothing, you know, too many things can change. Others have the whole spreadsheet out multiple years of who's going to be at what point in their, you know, roster restriction status. Uh, so where do you fall sort of on that spectrum? Because I've seen winners on both sides and losers on both sides. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say I'm more planned for the day, um, you know, and, and obviously the, I think that I do a pretty good job at balancing both sides for the most part. Um, so like, like last toward, towards the end of the playoff race, uh, you know, last year I went to, uh, you know, all the double A rosters, all the triple A rosters, all the single A advanced and just went through and said, who's aging out at each of these places. And I said, okay, who do I think might get cut? might be on the waiver wire, might be looking for a job. Um, so I, I think there's some, you know, preliminary things that I go through. And obviously, you know, as the minor league free agents are released through the off season and, uh, you know, as, you know, teams decline or pick up options, I think you just kind of have to roll with the punches for the most part and just kind of plan uh, the best you can. Cause obviously you know, you can plan for a guy and then you ask him, Hey, do you have any interest? And he's like, no, man, I, I don't want to come there. And then, you're like, <laughs> and then you're like, Oh, well, okay, shoot. I, I got a reverse course now, but um, no, I, I think it's, it's a fair mixture. Cause obviously I, you know, I do want to keep guys as long as possible, but at the same time, I, I understand that, you know, these, a lot of these guys have families, a lot of these guys have kids and this is their career. And, you know, they all had major league dreams at one point. And so, you know, I understand our role in their careers and what we're supposed to do for them. And so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't try and plan for guys to stay multiple, multiple years. Cause I think that's doing them a disservice. Um, if you want to stay multiple years by any means, if you're successful and you're, you're enjoying it and this is, you know, the career you see for yourself, Absolutely. I've, I've no issue with that, but for a lot of guys who were bringing in from the minor leagues and, you know, or straight out of college, they hope to get back to affiliate. And so, you know, we, to, to make the player happy, to make everybody happy, we, we need to take certain measures. And obviously that's bringing in a guy understanding that, Hey, he might only be here for a month. Mm -hmm. So I might look, I might look forward and say, okay, I signed this guy for X amount of money. When he's gone in a month, how much money will I have and who can I sign then? And so those are kind of the things that I try and go through as a practice and say, oh, this, this guy's hitting 330. Uh, he might get signed. So I got it. So now I'm looking for outfielders because if I lose him, where does this offense kind of stand? And right. so I, I think it's just, it's, it's always trying to get ahead of the next step trying to beat the next step before you actually get there. And, you know, I think that's a tricky thing to do in indie ball because you can get put on your face any day of the week, but at the same time, you, you have to plan as best you can because otherwise there's no plan at all. So, um, you know, obviously I, I, I wish we could run it back with the roster we had last year. I felt like we had a lot of talented guys. You know, I felt like there was some things just, ball didn't drop our way sometimes. Um, but the reality is I won't be able to. And so, you know, we, we've been planning for months that we probably won't have the same roster. And so I feel like we have a pretty good, pretty good kind of setup on where we're going for this next year. Nice. All right, man. That's, that's all I got. I'm not going to drag you into anything else else to, for now, we'll see. Hey, um, I, wel I welcome yeah. the questions. <laughs> I know, and that's why I like it. I'm like, all right, I'm going to yeah. keep this in mind moving forward. But once yeah. again, ooh, I'll say the thing. Nick, your show, my man. I guess we'll have to just do the same thing we do every time, which is, Jack, if you have anything else you want to add, anything you want to say, promote, do anything like that, now's your time to do that. We give everyone uh, the time at the end, so we might as well give it to you too. Yeah, no, I mean, 
I, I, I love independent baseball. I think it's, it's a vital mixture in our game. I think it's needed for where baseball is going. And, you know, all I can say is we have a great thing going up in Lake country. I, I, th- I think it's the best in the business. I mean, Tom, he's a fantastic owner um, from top to bottom. The organization is run well. Uh, Ken Huckabee, great manager. Everybody loves him. All the players get along really well with him. Dave Pano, fantastic hitting coach. Paul Wagner, fantastic pitching coach. Um, you know, I'm just I'm really fortunate to be in the position that you know I, I'm in. I'm I'm very grateful that you know Lake Country was an expansion team, and you know I hadn't really put a lot of thought into them. And then one day I just I decided, you know, I I think this is the route that I kind of want to go. So it, it's it's such a great atmosphere over there. I think we're gonna have a great roster and. Hey, I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping we'll be hosting the tro- trophy at the end of the next year. So that's uh, that's what I'll promote. Hey, we hope to see you hosting the Miles Wolf Cup at the end of the year. Definitely, we'd like to see it, man. Very impressed what you've done so far. We're curious what you're going to do next, and we appreciate taking the time to come on today. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you for having me on. Uh, thanks again for Jack for coming on the show. Appreciate him. Hopping on. I know on my end, I was slacking the schedule this for a while. Uh, I kept meaning to, and then something else would come up or we have to work something out. And it was always a problem. It was always my problem that I couldn't get solved, but glad we got it solved. Great interview. Sure. We got a lot more to ask him. So we'll have him back on again. Closer to the start of the season. So there is that. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, we have someone else on next week that uh, is the reason why we pushed our conversation and our discussion on the Atlantic League South the review if you would a week back so do you want to say who we're going to have on or yeah man got Brady Salisbury which is going to be a fun time baseball operations for the guest Jenny Honey Hunter so not only talking about how he you know has taken guest Jenny from a really a, t- a tough to watch team in their first year to now uh, back to back playoff berths that's yeah, uh, going to be a good conversation man and I'm very excited about it. I, not only that, I mean, we're going to have to talk about the past year of Gastonia Honey Hunters. And oh, yeah. by the way, Gastonia baseball, because no longer the Honey Hunters. But we're going to have to talk about it. So I'm excited. It'll be interesting to see. Um, you know, uh, he's a guy who I, I personally would call a friend, but also a guy where him and I have had quite a year because while I know that he was you know, he was not supportive of the things going wrong in, in Gastonia. I also, by reporting on it, was making his job more difficult <laughs> uh, because it's hard to get a player to come when the major story about your team is that nobody's getting paid. Um, uh, he, so, yeah, but he, he rode with me. as saying, no, he's a real one. And uh, I'm excited to have him on, man. He's a very interesting guy. Yeah, like, I'm looking forward to it because there's just so much here to go after, which is, like, I don't want to open up with the... So, how much of a shit show was it last year? Yeah. And like, I'd love to, you know, avoid, you know, I, I don't want to just live in it. But yeah, so that's an interview to look forward to next week. We'll also do the ALPB South review next week. And we are aware there was at least the first, I guess we call it phase of the Pioneer League draft this past week. Mm-hmm. But they called it the first round, but I'm not sure I called that when you do two separate drafts. So I call them more right. phase one, phase two. So we'll talk about it probably next week, but we wanted to make sure we got all the other news in and the interview and we didn't have to worry about it. So given that this week was a really tight for time week, we figured let's move all the actual player discussion base and team discussion based stuff back a week when we'll have time to actually talk about it. Yeah. So we'll have. What next week's going to be like Brady, some draft talk, some ALPB South talk. Love it. And then I'm sure like something random is going to happen on Thursday too. I'll be like, hey, guess what you're doing? And at some point, I'm going to have to say the old, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying not to be the negative guy. And I guess, uh, I guess this is where you do plugs and I do plugs and then we leave and then I edit this when I get this file at two in the morning. Yeah, that's about right. Um, yeah. Uh, I will say, yeah, Indie Ball Nation on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, all that. That's about it. Yeah, that's all I got. 
not promising anything's going to come out. I never know anymore. I think I know, but I usually don't. That's where I'm at, too. We're just like, look, you can rely on the podcast. And that's about it. Everything else is a real crapshoot. And every <laughs> offseason, I say, like, this is going to be the year. We're going to actually put a good content. We're going to have, like, one substantive thing every week. And we're going to have a couple other social media posts. And then I never do. But <laughs> Indie Ball Pod on Twitter. Indie Ball Report everywhere else. Maybe there's something. Maybe there isn't. Who the hell really knows? I sure as shit don't. But Nobody maybe you do. knows. Trouble you've seen? <laughs> oh, man. Until next time, don't forget to uh, play ball. <laughs> <laughs>